really wonderful to have amazing speakers from some of the most important financial institutions uh, globally. Um, and we're going to go straight in because we're a little bit over time because I rambled on too long. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's let the lady go first, I think, Chen Yan. Sure. Um, as the CIO for one of the largest institutional investors, uh, you look at the macro, you look at the mac markets, um, and you know, maybe you can kick us off with some of the key themes you're seeing in both the stock market and the bond market, and how should investors look at these core assets, as we call them? Sure, no yeah. problem. Can I have my first slide? Good morning, yes. everyone. Uh, I'm Chen Yan from AIA. I'm the uh, CIO, Chief Investment Officer. Not information officer nowadays, there's a CIO <laughs> yeah. for information officer as well. So my first slide, let's look at uh, our market um, <coughs> so far. So we just experienced low interest rate environment for the past 15 years after GFC. For the next decade or even longer, what we experiencing would be the end of cheap money, which means low interest rate. Now interest rates are higher for longer. You can argue when the Fed will cut interest rates and whatnot, but anyways, it's pretty high and could be sticky for a while because in, uh, inflation is also quite sticky. So 2023, we started as a pretty good year, right? Last year was a lot of uh, pessimism in the market, especially equity market, because people focus on equity a lot. Everything's down 10, 20%. This year, if you look at all the equities across the board, they are all in the positive territory. China will put that aside. <laughs> China has a different uh, situation to deal with. Bond market also starting to turn positive, even though the yields are still quite high. Okay, gold still rounds, oil still rounds, especially recently due to the unrest in Middle East. So 2023, at the very beginning, looks like a much better year, but life is with is not without volatilities and uncertainties. So what we're dealing with right now with uh, higher for longer interest rates, which means that funding will be expensive, liquidity will be scarce, and we also have a bit of headwinds, uh, the soft uh, domestic consumption from China, US-China tension, the unrest in Middle East, all these are adding volatilities <coughs> to our environment. Okay, so it's uh, fundamentally, it will start to look better but you still have a lot of head wings. Uh, interest rates are not going to go down anytime soon. Maybe uh, will go down slightly, but it will still be quite high. Equities, you can see so far still in the positive territory. That's global equities, that's US equities. Okay? <coughs> then you can look at all the other fundamentals. It's still quite in, on the way to recovery but the recovery might be challenging going forward. So it's a, quite a challenging and dynamic market to navigate from here. Wonderful, thank you, Chen Yan. Um, maybe I can turn to Joel, and uh, I was just wondering, uh, maybe the audience is less familiar with Dimensional. <laughs> Who knows Dimensional? <coughs> I've heard of Dimensional here. Okay, wow. Put your hand down. Okay. Who's heard of the Booth School of Business at University of Chicago? Put your hands up. Oof. Yeah. Okay, a little bit more, different crowd. It's more than normal, so. Yeah. yeah. So David Booth is the founder of Dimensional. Uh, he put his name on the University of Chicago School of Business. But Dimensional is one of the largest asset managers in the world and a leader in the systematic kind of evidence-based investing. So uh, maybe you can first of all introduce, you know, uh, Dimensional and how it's so different and unique. Um, and then, um, you know, what, you should, what should investors be doing? in this market and macro environment, does it actually affect you in any way? Yeah. Sam, thank you um, for the questions and thanks for the opportunity of, of being here today with, with our investors. I think to start with Dimensional, Sam's right, Dimensional is, is a very large asset manager which is in um, you know, 10 countries around the world. We have 14 offices, head offices in the United States, in Texas of all places. And for Asia, head office is here in Singapore. We've had an office here for, for 10 years and been working with Endowa since before you, were, before you started uh, taking money at the very start. So uh, very pri privileged to have that opportunity. So yes, we are a large manager. We manage somewhere between six to 700 billion US dollars, depending on what markets are doing. They're always going up and down, as my colleague just um, enlightened us here from, from AIA. And we have a, a very different approach 
to investing. So um, we're a privately owned firm. We manage equity and fixed income, um, real estate investment trusts and commodities, just equity and fixed income for Endow Us. And our approach is that, uh, as, um, as my colleague just said, there's a lot of uncertainty in markets. And security prices go on a random walk every day up and down based on our expectations around what future earnings are going to be. And so Dimensional's approach is to buy everything, buy everything we can on the planet. So a typical Endowos portfolio might have 13,000 securities in it from Dimensional because we want to capture the return of capital markets and get the return that capital markets owe investors. And over the long term for equities, that's been about 10% or so. And so we don't have any more information than the market. We have a lot of very bright people that work on Dimensional. There's five Nobel laureates who've been associated with Dimensional and helped build our investment strategies. But we're humble enough to know that there's hundreds of millions of people putting information into prices every single day. And there's a lot of information in that price we can use to build better portfolios. Number one is own everything. Number two is, as you say, keep costs low, own it very, very cheaply, and then rather than try and forecast whether markets are going to go up or down, just be fully invested in those asset classes, equity or fixed income all the time. And then there's some small things that we can do that we know about information in prices that can give us higher expected returns if we're disciplined and patient and systematic in our approach. And so um, I have a slide very quickly I'll put up, Sam, and then I'll stop. If I can go to the slide, please. Uh, if you think about all the securities you could buy on the planet, um, you know, there's thousands of them. And so every single one of these balls could represent a security. They all have different expected returns and we accept the price of all of them, but there is information we can use that tells us which securities have higher returns over the long term. So in a dimensional portfolio, we buy everything and we slightly overweight those securities that have higher expected returns. That's all to do with discount rates. The higher the discount rates, the higher the expected returns. And there's three main things we focus on in equities that give you those high returns. We can talk about that later. Sam, thanks for the opportunity. Wonderful. Just like um, all of us are dressed very differently today, right? <laughs> all the way from Joel uh, to Subhash at the end. Um, I'm much more casual, actually, with uh, sneakers and T-shirt, but I could put a jacket on for this. Um, but as, as we dress differently, uh, there is a, a lot of investment choices out there. Uh, so I think it's really important for us to correctly assess the different opportunities and options available to us, and that's why we listen to these experts. So Subhash, I'm going to turn to you now with the topic du jour, inflation, interest rates. Chin shared with us, higher for longer. Um, so, you know, how concerned are investors in Asia and what investment approaches are available which help address some of these concerns about inflation, interest rates and, you know, where we're headed going forward? Thank you, Sam. And thank you, everyone. Um, this is an amazing crowd, so fantastic. Um, okay, just before we get into the nitty-gritty of inflation, my favorite topic for the last two years, um, just a little bit about me, Subhash Pillay. Born in Malaysia, worked in Australia and Singapore. Um, good to be back home, frankly. Uh, and um, I lead investment solutions at, at Franklin Templeton across Asia Pacific. What does that mean? That means building huh? blended asset portfolios that look to deliver. Can we get a handout mic? We've lost it's sound. Working. Yeah, yeah, we lost yeah. sound. Wow. There oh, go. there you go. You're it's back. It's back. I'm back. All right. Well. Thank you, everyone. Um, just <laughs> yeah. a quick introduction. Subhash Pillay, lead multi-asset or investment solutions across APAC at Franklin Templeton. At Franklin Templeton, we've been in Asia for a very long time, about 30 years in Singapore alone. So um, really, really pleased to be supporting um, and partnering with Endowers here. So topic du jour, topic last couple of years, Inflation, how's that impacting on investors and so forth? So firstly, a little bit on inflation. The, the path that we've seen over the last couple of years has been this explosion in terms of inflation, up to numbers of 8, 9, 10% in different countries, even here in Singapore, getting into the sevens from memory. But over the last year, we've been seeing this deceleration in inflation. So if you look at US inflation, They've got about 20 measures. They all have about a 4% level to them. If you look at Singapore, come back down to 4%. 
But here's the challenge, the contemporary challenge, the now challenge with inflation, which is that pace of reduction has really slowed over the last quarter. And there are some new challenges, challenges around oil prices, energy prices, of course, the horrible scenes in the Middle East adding to that geopolitical woes that we're kind of having to deal with. So with that background, how does that impact investors? Well, it impacts investors in two key ways. First is, obviously, we're, worried. we're investors in markets. Inflation impacts markets. How's that impacting on our investments? But secondly, it also impacts via cash flows. And I think it's often the thing that we actually don't think enough about. All of us here, our, our living costs have risen by 10, 15% in the last two years. Now, how does that impact your ability to save, your ability to, to contribute to your investment portfolio? And then secondly, many of us have debt. Interest rates have risen, and that servicing aspect is something where you now have these competing demands for your, sur for your surplus. Do you invest? Do you support reduced debt that you have? So what are investors doing? Um, one of the key things that we're seeing is that I think as inflation has risen and become more of a consideration, investors are looking to get benefits from their portfolio throughout the investment time horizon, rather than having more of a longer term, you know, what's the total return opportunity five, 10 years away? So that is driving a lot of flows into income star products, um, where really the benefit that you're getting from investment is happening across the shorter term in terms of higher distributions. So income tile products are typically giving you six, seven percent, sometimes higher, and they're also giving you some prospect for capital gains. And that works for investors in this environment because they are able to get that stream of return that can help either with living costs or help with managing your uh, managing your responsibilities if you have borrowings that are supporting your portfolio or support or, or your house, for example. So I think that's one major area of change. The other aspect I think that, that, that inflation has done is, of course, that's changed the full interest rate environment. It doesn't matter where you live. Interest rates are either 300, 400, 500 basis points higher. And that has changed relativities, as, as Chunin showed, that has resulted in a meaningful repricing in assets. And so there is greater uncertainty around how do I stay diversified? And so I think that that is actually also prompting investors to want a more diversified approach and also be a little bit more tactical because some of the moves that we are seeing are quite unusual in size and magnitude. Wonderful, Subhash. Um, going back to Chen Yan, um, <coughs> you mentioned we talked about high for longer, but I just got um, a few clients yesterday asking me, when is fixed income going to turn around? <laughs> right? We've had two negative years of returns annualized, 21, 22. This is, if this year we've just turned negative in returns, and it's been very volatile, right? So maybe we'll still end the year positive, but if we have a third year of negative returns for fixed income, it's the first time in history that this has happened. So people are not used to it because it's considered a safe asset, right? So from an asset allocation perspective, what are your thoughts on fixed income and is it going to come back? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. So um, I, I tell our agents and uh, clients uh, every single time um, I'm on stage and sharing how to invest. Think about it, why, why are we all doing it here? We are not here to listen to one stock idea, right? We are here to create our wealth in the long run, create our, uh, and accumulate our wealth for our retirement or for our next generation. There's never, never a good timing to get into the market. If you look at fixed income right now, negative return or just turn slightly negative, isn't that a great chance to go into the market? A great entry point. And when you are going to the market, don't think about I'm going to invest in that bond or that equity. You have to think about asset allocation. You have to put large part of your wealth or your, your available cash flow for long-term asset allocation. That means allocating to different asset classes, fixed income, equities, or whatnot. 
Okay, it's never going to pay you back if you just focus on one stock or one bond. That never pays off. So long-term asset allocation is key. And how do you select the managers that can help you to invest? Um, in the world, there's about 61,000 listed companies. For the past, uh, my statistics shows, past 30 years, okay, 61% of the companies are creating negative values for the global wealth, for the global equity market. 37.5, 37.38% of the companies are creating positive values just to offset the negative values created by those 60% of the companies. So they, they, they net each other off, left with 1.3% of the world's equity markets, listed stocks, 1.3% of the companies in the whole world. They're actually creating the 33.5 trillion dollar of the capital market that we enjoy today. What does that mean? You need professional investors to select the stocks for you every single day. That's what they do best. That's what you pay them to do. Don't select the stocks yourself. And select the right managers that can pick the 800 out of the 61,000 companies that are actually creating values for the past 30 years and will be the companies that create the values for the future to come. What does that tell us? You have to invest in, yes, you can invest in passive funds. That can be a part of your investment portfolio because we, none of us like volatilities. Active managers and the active managers who can steer through this very uncertain times for you, who can select those 800 companies out of 61,000 companies. So you have to believe in the stewardship, believe in active management, on top of your passive allocation, of course. So that's very important part. One, invest for the long term, focus on asset allocation, don't select single stocks. I think all of you here are making the right step towards creating long-term wealth. Because all of you here are listening to us on stage, we talk about not one stock, right? We're not here to tell which stock to invest, but tell you it's important to stay invested, stay for the long term, and select the funds that can help you to generate returns in the long run. The funds that will focus on the 800 actually create values for the whole world, not the 61,000, okay? And the last thing, you have to believe in your own investment style. You have to be true to yourself, who you are as an investor. How much risk can you take? That will determine how much equities and fixed income you can go into. So the risk profile, very easy. More conservative ones, 30% equities. Balance one, 60%. If you are really aggressive, 90%, right? That's a rough, rough guide of which risk profile you are in, all right? then you have to understand who you are. That, that really starts from within who you are and invest in long term, for long term, stay invested and select the funds that can help you navigate through the very uncertainty times, okay? Thank you, Chen Yan. Um, going back to you, Subash, you are a multi-asset guy, right? So we're gonna talk about the asset allocation that Chen Yan highlighted. But I was just looking at the Slido questions, the top voted. Guys, if you don't vote, then you're not gonna come up we don't have time for all the questions, so I'm going to only focus on the top voted questions, but all of them are actually individual questions about different asset classes. So the first one was currency, US dollar. Second highest voted is golden commodities. Third one is Singapore REITs, very specific. <laughs> and then the fourth one is China. And the first one, fifth one is inter interest rates and fixed income. So it's all asset classes, right? And, and when, when Chin Yan says that asset classes, asset allocation is important, it's because long-term asset allocation drives more than 90% of returns because each asset has a certain characteristic. It, it, it goes uh, with it certain risk, which is measured by the volatility of returns, and then how much long-term returns it normally would give you. So if you asset allocate in the right way, then that's what's gonna drive the returns over the long term, that's what it means. So Subhash, from a multi-asset perspective, can you answer some of these questions? What are the best <laughs> ones? All right, well look, let's start with what no one's asked about, which is the largest capital markets in the world, right? So the United States, 60% of equity markets, mm. larger, um, you know, a larger part of fixed income markets, and then I'm gonna come back, mm. right? So 
If you were to ask us where we see the best risk-adjusted opportunities right now, we actually see it in high-quality fixed income, high-quality US fixed income. So when you see 10-year bond rates at around 5%, um, when you see investment-grade credit well into the sixes, these are returns where if you buy and hold to maturity, you have appreciable, decent levels of return. But typically, if you look at the last six US rate hike cycles, typically when the Fed is done, in the next 12 months, you actually see bond yields fall, 10-year bond yields fall, by somewhere between 50 to 150, 200 basis points. So for us, we feel as though the US Fed is closer to that end point, if they haven't already hit it. And so for us, we see high quality fixed income as, from a risk adjusted perspective, an attractive place to be because you can see returns close to double digits if you see, if you see um, bond deals rally, which would be our expectation, especially given the large sell off. You know, you highlighted we are close to three years now of negative returns. If you add up the negative returns in US fixed income, it's close to 25%. That's the largest drawdown. Why? Because frankly, things were priced with retrospect. You know, I think you guys would have all seen charts that kind of go the amount of bonds that have negative yields, 12, million, 12 trillion, 13 trillion, 15 trillion. I don't know where it got to. That chart is right at about zero now, right? So you've seen that repricing. So that for us <coughs> drives, that is kind of like, you know, a, an attractive market. Um, you know, we continue to see uh, attractiveness in the US equity market. Again, you've seen a large drawdown. Yes, you've seen recovery this year, but now you're actually seeing that given away. So we see select opportunities there. When it comes to emerging markets, one of the questions, I told you I'd get to those. Mm -hmm. um, now, keep in mind, emerging markets, less than 10% of the investable equity markets. Now, the challenges you face, the challenges you face there are, of course, we're still at a, a more elevated stage of geopolitics. Um, and also, while there is stimulus ongoing in China, we get to kind of see that really strong st stimulus that propels the economy forward. So what we do see in emerging markets is definitely very attractive valuations. It's a sensible place for long-term investment, but I think you need to be patient in your expectations because there are ongoing risks, there is ongoing adjustment. Coming to currency, um, sorry, you gave me quite a few. So uh, you, to, you don't have to answer all of them, but I'm just on currency, on currency, US dollar. Yeah. You know, I think the US dollar for us, <clears throat> we would favour as the US Fed looks more and more done in terms of their work, mm -hmm. and 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 attention moves much more towards, well, what will be the path down? Then I think you will see some moderation in the US dollar. Okay. <clears throat> At this point, I'm going to make a confession. Um, I've been investing for almost 30 years, professionally. I'm a professional. I've been working professionally for 30 years, even though I look like this. I, I have the gift of immaturity, so I'm very <laughs> immature, uh, so I look younger. But, um, I, and, you know, when I was a professional money manager at Morgan Stanley, I used to run tens of billions, and, you know, I did pretty well. I got, you know, to CIO and CEO, so I must have done something right. Uh, but when I look at my returns, if I can, like, beat the market, 51% of the time, I'd be really happy. It's a very difficult thing to do. And so we talk about asset allocation a lot because that's the high level, the strategic asset allocation that's important. But when we talk to investors, and you guys have all tried it, it's very difficult to beat the market. It's almost more difficult than impossible to also time the market. So that's why I think you know, a lot of people turn to passive in investing. And, you know, that's why we've had this passive investing revolution. But there is a place for active. Um, but dimensional kind of sits, it seems like in between. So yeah. what, is, what is that? So <clears throat> just, you know, explain to us, first of all, the advantages and maybe of passive investing, yeah. index investing. And what do you think dimensional does that enhances the passive investing experience? Yeah, thanks, Sam. I, I think just first of all, your points on asset allocation are, are super important. One of the great um, opportunities we have working with Endow are saying we, as investors, is they have strategic asset allocation portfolios that are rebalanced for you on like a, a daily basis. So 
whether markets are going up or down or our opinions on what happened to interest rates or the US dollar or which market's going to outperform, you don't have to worry because your asset allocation is taken care of. The next thing is then how do you get the best return from that asset class? And so dimensional is a mix between traditional passive indexing and traditional active. Like indexing, you are broadly diversified and you're low cost and the founders of dimensional actually built the world's first index fund back in 1971. So we've been at this for a while and it's great. Um, the benefits of that are you will capture market-like returns. The disadvantage is that traditional indices structure portfolios towards, they overweight the parts of the market that have the lowest expected returns, which are large cap growth companies because their prices are very high. It's because they're good companies. Um, Dimensional says that's great. We should be low cost, should be diversified, try and capture the return of markets. But if you look to what actually drives returns of security prices, it's discount rates. Companies that have more risk associated with them, more subjectivity around their future cash flows, investors will apply, apply a higher discount rate too. The higher that discount rate, the higher the expected return. That's what the investor's return is. It's the discount rate of security you purchase. So dimensional. For those that are yeah. less familiar, can you yeah. explain a little bit about the concept of this company? Sure, it's the cost. Like it's the cost of capital of a company trying to get your money. You can lend money to a company in form of a bond, or you can buy shares in the company. And the riskier they are, the lower the price. Okay. So, from what does dimensional do? Dimensional says, okay, let's capture the return of markets, and let's look at the data going back a hundred years. And let's look at the world's best theory around how securities are priced, trying to marry the two to systematically try and get the return of the market or better. So if we go to the slide, please, folks. Um, I talked about all companies have different expected returns. Some have higher expected returns. Which ones are they? They're related to discount rates. And we'll go to the next slide. And here's the last um, sort of 100 years. Oh, sorry, go back, please. OK. so. What Dimensional tries to do is to systematically buy lower cost companies that are highly profitable. Every single day, we remain fully invested. And so three columns of data here. The first on the left-hand side is the US stock market. This is going back almost 100 years. And there's three elements, three dimensions of expected returns in equities that have given you high returns. First, to do with cost, or relative cost. Small companies, the small companies, have given you higher returns than large companies. For about 100 years here, you had about almost 2% per year, per year, higher return from small companies. Who would have thought that? Second is the relative price. This is the multiple at which they trade in the market. Companies that trade at a small multiple to their book value are less attractive, they look more risky, they've given you higher returns almost three, over 3% 3 per year for almost 100 years. And then on top of that, more profitable companies, based on their profitability today, saying nothing about what it's going to be in the future, have given you higher returns. So if every day you systematically just overweight smaller, lower relative price, higher companies, or in Singapore parlance, cheap and good, la. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do. I've been in Singapore for eight years now, right? That's what we're doing, really, and earning thousands. I would respectfully disagree with some of my colleagues that you need to find the best managers and best stocks. You don't. Buy everything, buy the ones that are lower relative price and higher return. And that, those, that data extends to the rest of the developed world, which you've got over 70 years worth of data, same pattern. Small, low relative price, high profitability companies have outperformed, and the same in emerging markets. Okay? There's over 45 countries represented here. Whether markets are, are efficient or they're not, it doesn't matter. These systematic differences occur, and that's what dimensional focuses on every single day in equities. In fixed income, it's the same. We're broadly diversified. We focus on the dimensions of return, which is around having a variable approach to the duration of your portfolio and the credit quality of your portfolio based on whether yield curves are upwardly sloped or downwardly sloped and credit risks are wide or narrow. So I don't want to chew up too much time, Sam, but that's the point I wanted to make. You don't have to forecast on everything. Cheap and good, law. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to go turn to the audience question. And the top voted one 
is not a surprise is China. Um, can I direct it to Chen Yan? <laughs> maybe talk about your thoughts about China and maybe, yeah, just thoughts about China. <laughs> it's, it's such a complicated <laughs> topic, guys. Of you course. can talk about anything you want <laughs> about China. Sure, no problem. Um, <clears throat> we have a love and a hate relationship with China, right? I mean, it's the world's second largest economy. It carries a lot of weight uh, in many industries. Um, and our clients, customers, all love China uh, for a very good reason. So where's China now? I think uh, there are a lot of uh, hope for China at the beginning of the, the year. China did perform after they, re they reopened. It was up very nicely. But you have to realize that China is such a huge economy for it to recover sharply like a V-shape is nearly impossible because they have fundamentals they need to fix and the government is trying to do that. Actually, the Beijing government is doing a lot, a lot of right things. They're trying to deleverage not just the government's balance sheet, which is humongous, but also individual's balance sheet because they are trying to come down on the property market, right? So property rise by at least three to five times, depending on which city you're looking at. In the past 10 years, that's how a lot of people become wealthier. Um, is that the right level? Might not be. So now they are trying to force a more normalized property price across China. That hits everybody's balance sheet, right? It's, it's the largest part of the GDP. So you can't expect a country whereby the whole country is experiencing that kind of uh, revaluation, normalization of the balance sheet, coming down the property prices that will, their, their balance sheet value will drop right away, right? And that touches every single family in China. We can't expect they will just recover like that tomorrow. It's impossible. So they're feeling the pain, but it's a great way to set the company, sorry, the economy back to more healthier status. This is a pen that they have to go through. But is China uninvestable? Of course not. It's such a good um, you know, place for a lot of very innovative companies. So when everybody, especially you know, more Western um, school of thought that you know, there's, they're not going back to China or they are pulling out of China, it's a great timing to go into it. That's why you see a lot of uh, true investors, institutional investors, professional investors, they start to select really good companies, good quality companies with strong cash flow, strong balance sheet to invest. And that they might benefit from this uh, years down the road. But you have to be patient with China. It's going to take time. Thank you, Chen Yan. I lied, guys. That was not the top voted question. The top voted question was actually, in fact, is in Daos leveraging on Gen AI for advice? But I left that to the end because uh, I can answer it. <laughs> uh, I think the question comes because a lot of people use the term robo-advisor. Um, and I, I've written an article about this that it's actually a misnomer. There is no robot or robo that's going to like perfectly predict the market and therefore beat the market every time. If, look, if somebody developed that, there will be a billionaire or a trillionaire richer than Elon Musk. And they shouldn't share it with anybody else um, because they can corner the market and make all the money. It doesn't exist. And the second thing is robo-advisors, the, the ones that we know, do not really focus on advice, which is what I was trying to tell you, right? They're trying to develop a product with an algorithm that's going to try to beat the market, and that's the wrong approach. Um, and we talked about a lot of the right ways of investing. And so um, Indaos does not have a robot that's going to solve all your problems. GenAI and OpenAI is not, ChatGPT is not, going to solve all your investing problems. There's a reason why they don't allow you to ask about financial stuff, um, because they can't. Um, but there's a lot of things that it does, which is it, it, there's a lot of things that makes you efficient, allows you to be more efficient, allows you to um, you know, really improve your experience as well. So that's where we'll be focusing on. So yesterday, we had a presentation on AI, how it's applied at Endowas um, through the chatbot, uh, through content aggregation, and filtering, you know, um, finding things that you were looking for on the Endowas platform much more efficiently and, and help us as a business to be more efficient as well. So please check that out. 
you can actually go to the YouTube, watch it, and also scan the code so you can test out uh, the new Gen AI chatbot that we've developed. So with that, I'm going to wrap up. And thank you so much, Joel, Chinyan, Subash, for your deep insights and for being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Sam.